Welcome to In The Loop Podcast, a podcast that is inspired by the breakaway roping lifestyle. I'm your host, Jordan Joe, professional rodeo athlete, NFR qualifier, and business owner. My goal is to promote the sport of breakaway roping alongside with celebrating and highlighting elite competitors in and out of the arena. This podcast shares the raw and the real of breakaway roping, bringing you behind the scenes stories from competitors, producers, leaders, and the trailblazers, all sharing stories of the Western culture and the lifestyle that they live daily. Join me to talk about breakaway roping, the history, the present, and the future of our sport. If you want to be in the loop, you're in the right place. Thank you for joining us. Take a listen. Hey guys, it's Jordan Joe. I'm so excited for this series, and I'm really excited that Lone Star Ropes has come on board to be an official exclusive sponsor of this episode series. So Visit LoneStarRopes.com for the ropes that you need to make it to the pay window. Handcrafted in Buffalo, Texas, Lone Star Ropes aren't like anyone else's. Their attention to detail can be found in everything crafted by Lone Star. Nobody makes ropes like the master rope maker, Guy Alford, and his team of experts including some of the world's best breakaway ropers. The sport's top athletes, including a world champion, NFR qualifiers, they all swear by the pink caddy. The caddy is fast and consistent with a great feel and great tip weight. Visit LoneStarRopes.com to find a dealer near you. And don't forget, we also offer the best team ropes in the business. Find what you're looking for at LoneStarRopes.com. Lone Star Ropes, a different kind of company making a different kind of rope. That's what sets us apart from the rest, and that's just fine with us. Okay, guys, today we are here with Paige Lawrence, champion. She goes by PL, Paige Lawrence. Um, (laughs) Paige, thanks for coming to the show. Absolutely. I always get so awkward when people ask me my name because I'm just like, I don't know. Is it Paige Lawrence? Is it Paige champion? Is it Paige Lawrence champion? Just call me Paige. (laughs) You have taught me so much, and I'm so excited to have you on the show today. But you know, something I really want to talk about is, you know, breakaway roping has been around forever, but it's just recently within the last couple of years become a professional level event. And so it seems like sometimes we've kind of reinvented the wheel or we're trying to reinvent the wheel and we've got to go all in and we've got to be prepared and we've, we've got to be confident. We've got to be strong and ready and, you know, show up blasting guns blazing. And so a couple of questions that we have today. We're talking about mindset and, and what it takes to be in a good mindset and a great mindset to be a breakaway roper and to win. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I'm, I told you I was going to steal from you before the show is you said, you know, everybody wants to win, but what does that mean? Mm-hmm. So let's dive into that. What, in your professional opinion, how do you go about that? You know, we all want to win, but, but what does it mean? Gosh, starting off with just like, the biggest question of them all, right? I, I, I like to think of this really as goal setting because winning can mean the same to every single person, right? Going to the NFR, but it can also look very different for every single person based off of what your event is, based off of what level you're at, based off of your experience. And I think that when people actually stop for a second, and get clear on, well, what would winning look like for me? It, it causes a really great trickle down effect that leads to confidence and momentum and creating personal bests. And so I guess if I was going to just start with a heavy hitter, I'd pause and be like, well, what, what's a personal best for you? Looking at what you've done and what you want to accomplish, what's that happy middle of what's a stretch, but what's also doable. Because once you know what your win looks like, then you can start building just like purposely towards it. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. And I think too, like maybe just speaking for myself to get caught up in is you lose a little bit of your personal best or your identity and you start comparing yourself to other people in ways that are not helpful as an athlete. 
you mm-hmm. maybe start degrading yourself or saying, well, she does it this way. So I have to do it this way, or he does it this way, instead of complimenting and, and growing and learning from other people, and then bringing that back in. So talk a little bit about that. Um, I know that, that you see that a lot in your athletes. So how do you navigate that? So there's two main types of goals that I really believe hold a lot of power in sport and business. Um, And that's outcome goals and performance goals. So outcome goals are results oriented. It's like, I want to win X amount of money this season, or I want to win Cheyenne, right? It's, It's a result that feeds your fuel and your motivation to go and do these hard things. And they're awesome. Obviously they're very motivational, but what's tricky about them is a lot of times they're connected to external variables, right? If you want to win Cheyenne, it's not just a reflection of how you're showing up and roping. It's a reflection of how the field of competitors roped. It's a reflection of the ground. I mean, I don't know a lot about breakaway roping as you know, so (laughs) it's a reflection of like what the score is and all of those things. There are a lot of external variables, right? It's not just you doing your thing. It's bigger picture. So Mm -hmm. exciting. It's motivating. It's an awesome goal, but it can also be distracting and discouraging and frustrating when say we rope our best and our best isn't good enough, right? That's when we get frustrated. That's when we get discouraged, when we throw our sucker in the dirt and we're like, man, maybe I am not good enough. So I like performance goals to be the main focus of what I help my clients to use because your performance goals are 100% in your control. They're focused on you being your personal best. They're related to every action that you can take to show up and compete as your best. And so what's awesome about those is we're focusing in on like the doing, right? We're focused in on breakaway roping and on you doing your thing. And we get really crystal clear on what would it look like if you showed up at Cheyenne and were 10 out of 10 on that day. If you were the best you could absolutely be, define that for me. Write those down into bullet points. Because then when you go out and pursue those, one of two things happens. One, you are 10 out of 10 because you're focusing on all the good things. And you walk away from there knowing that you showed up as your best, whether you won or whether you were third or whether you were 15th. Okay. So that can breed confidence that can breed momentum. You know, where to build from, or the second thing happens, you show up and you make some mistakes and you're like five out of 10. Okay. What's also really helpful about this situation being focused on performance goals. You look back at that list and you're like, Ooh, I didn't do that, that, or that. Oh, makes sense. Why I didn't win. Oh, makes sense. Why I didn't rope my best. I know exactly where I want to fix and improve on for the next one. So it puts the power back in your control and it gives you, I think, more easily attainable and controllable aspects of your career to focus on. Yeah, I agree. And something we touched on before is when you show up and you do those things, Mm -hmm. it, you know, initially you do set the goal like, okay, I want to win Cheyenne. But when you back off and you show up and you do the 10 out of 10, that outcome goal kind of, it kind of evaporates and and you're not so much focusing on that as you're focusing on, on yourself and you've done the work and what you're capable of. And so Mm -hmm. it just takes, it's like a load of bricks taken off of you. Yeah. And quite often in sport, especially in a sport of milliseconds, sometimes like your best is, is going to be enough to win. I'm just using Cheyenne to win the big rodeos, right? That's awesome. That's what we want. And sometimes your best isn't going to be good enough on that day. And that's also just like a part of sport. And I think that having that realistic attitude and the right focus, it also makes the highs and lows of sport a lot smaller and less Mm -hmm. noticeable. They become like blips on the radar rather than these career defining moments. Because you, you know what you're supposed to be focusing on and you know where you want to build. And it's like, oh, great. Well, next one, moving on. Mm-hmm. Well, and one thing too, I think that's really cool. And we've talked about is when you show up and you do your job at the one for 80, it's really no different than you showing up and doing your job at Cheyenne. It's a different platform. It's a different setup, but you still have to do your job each and every day. And so 
even though those big goals are obviously something we want to obtain, we, we all start, you know, you have to start somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. You train the basics in sport and you train the basics with your mindset. It's same, same, but different, but same, (laughs) but a little bit the same. (laughs) Well, and and touching on mindset a little bit, I want to talk about a fixed and a growth mindset. I know that that's something we've talked about and, and as you become aware of it, you start to see it. I see it now and I'm like, Ooh, fixed mindset. Ooh, growth mindset. So let's, let's talk a little bit about both of those things. Explain those to me and where you see um, both of those benefiting or taking away as, as an athlete. I love that you brought this up because I think that understanding these concepts um, are game changers. So Basically, a mindset is um, the way you see the world. It's made up of beliefs that you've had over and over. um, And it really impacts how you think, what you believe, how you act, how you behave at a subconscious level, right? It's this overarching thing that's kind of operating in the background. And so a growth mindset is this idea that regardless of where you start at with time and effort, you can improve your abilities. A fixed mindset essentially believes that you are given a certain amount of an ability and over time you'll reach that maximum mm, output. You, you won't be able to influence it anymore. And when I first say that to people, they're like, oh, well, obviously like I'm, I'm the growth mindset. Like I believe I can improve, but it shows up in very different ways. So uh, a fixed mindset, because we believe subconsciously that we're only able to improve a certain amount, it has this trickle down effect into our lives where we become very protective and defensive about our abilities. We're constantly comparing and measuring ourselves to a certain standard because we either did the thing and had enough um, skill level in that moment or we didn't. And that's a reflection like, oh, maybe I don't actually have that much amount. Um, We get caught up comparing ourselves to others because, well, my skill level is a certain amount and I want to know if I'm better or worse than this person. Um, A fixed mindset shows up in our openness to trying new activities or failure, coming up against setbacks. Because all of those things are a reflection, a negative reflection of our abilities. Mm -hmm. Whereas on the other hand, a growth mindset, because we have this idea that with time and effort, we can get better at anything. We become learners. Like comparison is an opportunity to learn what somebody else is doing and making that a goal for ourselves, coming up against setbacks or obstacles or failure. Well, They actually, they don't define who I am. There's something to learn from. And so over time, these fixed and growth mindsets lead people to very, very different outcomes in their lives. People with fixed mindsets tend to never discover their own potential because they're scared to step outside that comfort level, that comfort zone. People with a growth mindset, they tend to also never find their potential, but they get a heck of a lot higher because they're constantly finding ways to grow and get better. They embrace this learner's mentality. They're very process oriented, fixed mindsets, very outcome oriented. Um, And so they tend to see greater success, like almost unanimously. Mm -hmm. It's just facts. I forgot your question. I just rambled on about growth and fixed mindset. (laughs) Well, that's what it was about. But one thing I want to say that I thought was so cool is you and I were talking about this the other day and I saw myself in both categories in different places. And that was like, you're like, yeah, you're not going to be all, you know, it's going to vary just like you said. But one thing was cool is you started asking me some questions about how I was viewing other things. And I was like, oh yeah, this, this, this. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, that's definitely a fixed mindset. And you're like, oh, okay. You know, and so I thought it was how, you know, maybe a tip is to be aware and listen to how you're communicating about certain things and then try to reevaluate and be aware of which mindset maybe you're in, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I would definitely suggest like paying attention to your thoughts. They're going to be a strong indicator. 
Um, also, like you're not going to learn everything that you can about fixed versus growth mindset from my two minute spiel. So go get curious, do some Googling online, like read a book, you know, th- mm-hmm. those things I think are, are going to help expand your understanding of what this is. But ideally what I would love people to embrace, if you embrace nothing else about fixed or growth mindset is become more process oriented. So when you find yourself judging comparing now this is also like comparing yourself to yourself or yourself to other people to just pause and to become more process oriented so instead of looking at what you did or did not do say where could I get better where could I improve what could I learn from this experience to bring yourself back into the process the never ending Mm -hmm. then you're not done building or getting better and Mm -hmm. I think that that's even just a quick fix from fixed to growth mindset that would be beneficial to a lot of people listening. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's one cool exercise that, that I do after I wrote, you know, every run and you've helped me with that is what could I have done better? What did I do? Great. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And we move forward from there. And so that's helped a ton, but one thing I want to circle back to, and, and I think, I know I've struggled with this for a long time and you've helped me a bunch, but I know other girls have to as well is we have or do let our performance define who we are Mm -hmm. and it's a real struggle and you know like Mm -hmm. we'll just say breakaway roping like you either win or you don't so it is sort of a it I can see where it's easy to get into a fixed mindset because you're either fast enough or you're not but you don't Mm -hmm. ever take into account like your horse did this or the calf did this or you know none of that ever goes into our mind we're just like Mm -hmm. "Ah, I either won or I didn't you know but I do think it's it is something I've seen in myself and I, I know some of my friends too, like it's hard not to define yourself with your performance. So what are some tips and tricks and tools that we can add to our toolkit not to, to, to learn how not to do that? Yeah, well, one, what you just said, I think is important and maybe like should be written on a sticky note and put in your truck dashboard. Like my performances don't define who I am as a person, right? it's a, it's a fact, right. But starting to recognize that and train that as a belief in your life can look a little different. One, I think again, like awareness is key when we're relating our self-worth to our accomplishment, we need to be able to, to pick up on that and to give ourselves like a quick pause and say, I need to do some like changing of self-talk here. Um, but I think that a thing that would be helpful to start doing to see yourself as more than your performance is to is to simply like really what you said one of the things that you practice doing is to look at it from a little bit more of an observer third party and say what do i need to improve on as an athlete and what am i doing really great as a human Yeah. Simple. Mm -hmm. What do I need to improve as an athlete? What am I already doing great as a human? Or what what am I doing great as an athlete? And where do I need to be better as a human? I mean, Mm -hmm. doing these little check-ins with ourselves, it's only going to help us to see ourselves in different light. And that's a great thing. Being able to find areas to improve is a great thing. Um, And it's just getting in the habit, I think, of us understanding the parameters that we're doing the critiquing under <laughs> yeah. as a human or as an athlete. Hey guys, I just wanted to touch base with you and talk about some of the most consistent breakaway ropes in the business. Lone Star Ropes brings you the pink caddy along with the win and the consistency of these ropes is amazing. The weight of the ropes is great. The feel of the ropes is something that I truly love. Something I always struggled with growing up was I used really big ropes because I wanted the tip weight. And one thing that the team at Lone Star has done is they have made these ropes have tip weight, but they fit in my hand. And so I use a 9.5 to a 10.0, just kind of depending on the time of the year and outside rodeos and inside rodeos. But I will tell you that it fits in my hand. It has a fast feel, and it's something that I love to back in the box with. So if you are looking for a great breakaway rope, go check out LoneStarRopes.com. Now let's get back to it. I also think like one of the things that you said there, um, it's a bit of a pivot, but I'm just going to jump into it anyways. It's, it's, we're talking about confidence and building confidence here. And I think that this is something that 
is often under misunderstood for a lot of reasons because we think that confidence comes from accomplishing certain things, right? Right. Once I get the result, I'll be, I'll be confident. Once I make it to the NFR, I'll be confident in myself. But the truth of the matter is, if you can't find a way to be confident in who you are, the results won't make you confident. I know. I've done a lot of cool things. But before I did the work on building confidence in myself, I found that even after I did the things, I didn't think, like, I wasn't changed miraculously by a certain result. I still had the same doubts and vulnerabilities and insecurities. I just had those things with a fancy result attached to it. And so I really think that confidence is something that we start to create in the the small everyday moments. And that's done by simply shining a light on everything that we're doing good, on everything Mm -hmm. that we're doing great, in all of the ways that we're showing up as pretty darn okay, like a thumbs up. And I think in sports, I'm going off on a rant here, but do I'm it. Just keep going. Go I there. think in sports, it's, it's a big misconception that we have to be our own worst critic, right? Mm-hmm. You hear that from top dogs everywhere. Like I'm my own worst critic because if I can find my flaws then I can fix them. And yes, I totally agree. That's a piece of the puzzle of being an excellent athlete. But if you're only ever finding your flaws, how do you expect yourself to believe you're great under pressure, right? Mm-hmm. So I think what, what's actually more beneficial than being your own worst critic is showing up for yourself and creating confidence every single day by asking yourself, where am I doing pretty good? Where am I doing great? What foundation of confidence can I build at this level? knowing that I'm going to keep getting better and better, knowing that there's areas that I want to improve. Within this confidence, one thing that you shared with me one day was, you know, what are the win? What is the win for today? And I loved that because it made me step back and it wasn't so much big picture. Mm -hmm. It was like, I got up, I did my workout. I roped the dummy and it's good. It's okay. I didn't have to be Mm -hmm. like, well, I got up and then I ran five miles and then I did my workout and then I rode the dummy and then I rode 50 calves and then I ate lettuce. And then, you know what I mean? Like it was, (laughs) you know what I mean? It wasn't like a Hitler thing, like for for everybody, it looks different for everybody. And I think sometimes we get this misconception of like trying hard or working Mm. hard, you know, it looks different for everybody. And, and you helped me too. Like you talked a lot about when you were skating. You know, that's that, like you said, I, you had doubts, you had fears. Like, you know, you told me one time I used to look in the mirror and tell myself this, 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 and this before you went on the oh, yeah. ice. So, so talk to me about that. You were an Olympic skater. You were at the top of your level. What did you do when those fears came in? It's a good question. Again, I think that because obviously you had confidence. You had confidence knowing you, you did the work. You put the time in. You were there for a reason. But then the, they still came. And it's like, oh, thank God. She's human. Like, whew, I'm not the <laughs> only one. <laughs> but really, you know. Yeah. So I think there's a lot that goes into that, right? So one is intentionally training, right? Training with a purpose. So showing up every single day. And knowing that what you're doing is serving a a greater goal, right? So there's no just like crossing your fingers and I hope this works out. It's like, I'm doing these things every day because they serve a purpose. So that that really helps in those big moments where you have doubt and fear and insecurities. I also think that by training confidence in the small moments, finding the areas that you're doing really well and showing up for yourselves, like yourself every day, it also trains that muscle of being able to show up for yourself in those big moments. So when I'm in those big moments and I feel the nerves and the doubt, I can come back to it with a very real point of view. Hey, guess what? We've done A, B, C, D, all the way through the alphabet, you know, like in training, we feel really good about that. We know we've put the work in. 
also like we've felt insecure and fear in all of these little moments. And guess what? We showed up and we did really great because of them, despite them, instead of like panicking and throwing in the towel. Mm-hmm. So you've done this. Like it's, it's essentially building trust in yourself so that when in those big moments, because really showing up and having confidence in those big moments is a trust fall in yourself. You can't mm-hmm. guarantee you're going to be there. You just have to, you just have to feel the fear and go. Yeah. You've trained showing up for yourself. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Well, and you told me one day, you know, show up despite your fears. Yeah. Like, I think sometimes we get this misconception that when you do the work, they're not going to be there. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, they're just going to whoosh, go away, <laughs> evaporate. It yeah, just doesn't won't. happen though. No, they won't. They won't. And again, like I'm sounding like a re- like repetition here, but confidence is created in all of different types of moments. But gosh, wouldn't it be nice to show up in those moments where you feel fear and nerves and you know that you've done it before? Mm-hmm. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is by doing it once and then by doing it twice and then by continuing to do it over and over. Right. So confidence isn't feeling like you're unstoppable. It is also, but it's not the only thing you feel. It's feeling unstoppable despite all of the things that could stop you. Right. Well, and, and I think, like you said, I, I love how you said there, it's not just the only thing, you know, there's different components of it and different seasons and different times where you're at as an athlete to where it shows up. But it, mm-hmm. if you do the work, it can always be there. Mm-hmm. One thing that I have struggled with, and I know most girls, if they're honest, have struggled with, <laughs> is this little devil called perfectionism. Yeah. So. What a devil. Am, it is. I am a recovering perfectionist. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> but it's, it is. It's like you, you, we get in this mindset that we have to be perfect. There's no room for error. I think it also ties in with the fixed mindset. We've talked about that a bunch. Um, mm-hmm. What, how do you navigate through perfectionism? How do you navigate through perfectionism? Yeah, I think, I think this again comes down to, there's, there's basics of everything, right? So there's basics with mindset. And I think that self-talk, proper goal setting, those are two of those basics. And so a lot of time, perfectionism is, an expectation that we hold on ourselves. And I think that there's a difference between expectations and goals that a lot of people don't realize. So a goal is something that requires some time and effort to get better at. And there's a clear action plan associated with it. Like I know what I'm going to go and do to accomplish that. I've set myself up for success. Expectations tend to be this this standard that we compare ourselves to, but there's no actions associated with it. We don't know how we're going to go from A to B. And it's just this thing that we compare ourselves to. And quite frankly, often find ourselves falling short of perfectionism is an expectation that you're holding for yourself. This, this idea that you should go out and be perfect. So if that's you, I would love to like pause and say, define perfect for me. Like write that out. What would a perfect run, what would a perfect run look like here today? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Now, how do you want to go and do that? Bring it back to actions. Great. Is this something that you're 10 out of 10 confident in being able to go and do right now? If the answer is no, then we got to, we got to change it a little bit. Mm -hmm. We got to change the goal. We got to change the actions associated with it. And so it's disconnecting This idea that you have to show up and reach a standard that you don't even know what it means or looks like or how you're going to get there and reconnecting to know what's actually in my control, my capabilities, and how do I want to go and do that? Right. And unpacking it. Like one of the things we've, we've talked about and one of the books I love and you've helped me with is Daring Greatly by Brene Brown, which I will tell you guys, if you read it, like make sure you have some Kleenex. It's a little emotional. (laughs) 
That is so good. <laughs> but it really is. And, and it's unpacking it and calling it out and naming it and, and saying mm-hmm. it for what it is instead of just holding it all in and just striving and trying, like calling it out. And it's unreal what a sense of like just ease and peace it gives you to be like, okay, like you said, unpack it, you know. Yeah, most times if you actually pause and say like, okay, well, what would a perfect run here look like today? If you're being honest with yourself, you'll see how ridiculous you're being. <laughs> well, and right? I will tell you, if you want to feel ridiculous, <laughs> say it out loud to somebody else, and then you'll feel real ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, because you, you set yourself up with unattainable success, mm-hmm. right? And so I think there's, there's a very big difference between having these like big, bold goals and wanting to be perfect. Wanting to be perfect is setting yourself up for failure because it's never going to happen. And you'll always feel like crap after trying to pursue it. So instead, like have a real conversation with yourself, call out, great. If I wanted to be perfect, like what am I actually saying to myself? Recognize, okay, that's actually a bit ridiculous. What would be a really great goal here? Let's come back to reality. Let's come back to, for sure, make it a tough goal. Go for it. Make it a stretch, require some work and some effort. Absolutely. But I want it grounded in what could I actually do to go and make that happen? Right. In the fundamentals. And, and like you said, going back to the foundation, doing the work, pointing it out, all the things. It all circles within each other. It's really weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's really weird. <laughs> it's not weird. It's fun and interesting. <laughs> so another thing, you know, you work with a lot of <laughs> professional athletes, business owners, several different people. Um, What's the favorite, what, what, what do you love about coaching? What is the favorite part of what you do every day? Ooh, gosh, there's so many things that I love about what I do. So two things, I think one is that I know what it feels like to have the guts to pursue a really bold goal, goal. And I know how fulfilling and amazing it is to accomplish that goal, right? Like I I trained for the Olympics, like since I was four years old and I went to the Olympics when I was 24, right? There's There's a long time to pursue a goal. And so what's awesome about that is I know how good it feels to do it. And so I love working with other individuals who have the courage to choose these big, bold, audacious goals. And that I get to help them get closer to experiencing all of the fulfillment and amazing feelings that come from that. So like selfishly, I I just, I love being a part of other people's teams to help them access more of their own potential um, through hard conversations about themselves. And the other thing I like is that no two clients are the same. They're all different, even though a lot of their goals may look very similar. Everyone is different in a way. And so our conversations are always unique and it's really cool to just show up at work and, and to have interesting conversations with people where they're being open and honest, which, you know, they may not always be with Mm -hmm. themselves or with others. And so I really just feel grateful, I guess, for people's trust in me and being able to have epic conversations every day. Yeah. Well, and nothing is the same, you know, and I've been intrigued having those conversations with you. Like one of the hardest things I've ever done is to be honest Mm -hmm. about the struggles, about the Mm -hmm. raw, the real, all the things, but it's been one of the most freeing, like courageous things like I feel like I've like bench pressed 800 pounds when I do it you know um and I would encourage people to find somebody to do that with because I think well let me rephrase that I know with the work that I've done when you can get up and carry it that energy and that confidence and that courage as you walk out the door turns out when you get in the arena it follows you there yeah I, and I think it's, it's, it's one of those things, right? Like as athletes, we're all very good at doing. So when we have mm-hmm. a struggle, we're like, I'll just do more or I'll yeah. do differently, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to fix it by doing. And we don't often go inside and have hard conversations in our own brain. And yet 
who's out there when you go to rope, when you go to compete, it's you and your brain, Mm -hmm. right? And so you can't outdo what your brain's got going on, on the inside. And at some point in time, you're going to have to pause and do the work on the brain so that (laughs) you guys are on the same team when you go to compete. Well, and the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway is you got to do the work. You know, Mm -hmm. it's it's not, it's not like anything else. It's not a quick fix. I mean, it it can be, but all the things are going to come back at some point. (laughs) And so it's not a quick fix. It's, it's daily work in and out. There's no check boxes. Like, okay, once I get this figured out, it's never going to come back. Like, no, I wish. Yeah. No kidding. I'd be like, Ooh, smooth sailing, (laughs) but no, you know, it's not a quick fix. And, and it's, it's a, it's a lifestyle, you know, and and Mm -hmm. I have learned so much about taking it not just in the arena but outside of the arena and and it grows and it pursues and and it helps you in life as well oh yeah like it's you're working on you Mm -hmm. and then you show up as a competitor but you also show up as a partner and a friend and a business owner and a fun haver like we're working on you and then you get to show up in different avenues of your life yeah then it's pretty fun pretty awesome. (laughs) So I have some questions that our listeners have put in to ask you. Are you ready? Let's do it. Yeah. So if a person hasn't been successful under pressure in the past, how do you get over that to become successful under pressure in the future? Yeah. Great question. And again, I think that this, I think words are really powerful and they can set you up for success, or they can set you up for disappointment. And so when someone says, I haven't experienced success under pressure, I'd say, great. What are you actually defining success as number one, right? Let's get Mm -hmm. clear on the metrics that we're using to compare ourselves, to measure ourselves. And I would say, if you haven't been successful with those metrics to build some confidence and to build some momentum in the right direction, let's change those metrics a little bit. So think about where you're at and think about where you want to be and then say, what, what's a middle ground? What's a step in between who I am right now and who I want to be mm-hmm. that I could put my sights towards next. So maybe you're not going from like being bottom of the pack to, I really want to win a rodeo, but I just don't know how to do it. So maybe instead let's give yourself the goal of, I'd like to catch a paycheck at one rodeo this summer. And no, that's not where you want to be yet, but is that a heck of a lot better than what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Yes. Could you go out there and pursue that with a little bit more confidence? I would imagine so. Yes. Great. Well, let's break that down to action. So I would say my advice would be to define success and to find a middle ground so that you can check off that baby step in the right direction. And then what's the next baby step and what's the next baby step. Mm -hmm. And doing that, doing each step each and every day. Totally. (laughs) Next question is, how do you regroup and prepare yourself when practicing and being able to work on the things you're doing wrong isn't an option? For example, if you just missed your calf and you're on the way to the next rodeo. So this is a two-part answer, I think. Um, One. I hear you. You're asking about what do you do when you don't have time to train it? I do. But first things first, if and when you get the opportunities, training to regroup after a mistake is trainable. So in practice, start showing up for yourself and say, how do I want to recover from this this mistake? How do I want to group? What are my steps that I go through? So recovering from mistakes is just as trainable as not making mistakes. And again, if you can train those things, you gain confidence and able to being able to bounce back from a mistake. Okay. So that's very important. Number one, number Number two, (laughs) how do you bounce back from a mistake when you don't have the time? Right. I would say quick fixes, right? So instead of digging a deeper hole and like focusing on the 1 million things that you did wrong, which you probably didn't do, but your brain's trying to tell you that you did all of these things wrong. You're just making that hole bigger. You're making that mistake have a larger impact on your life than it needs to. So instead, one of my favorite rule of thumbs is like, tell me 
one thing you want to do better tomorrow and tell me three things that you did really well. And it sounds crazy. You're like, okay, but I didn't do really well. <laughs> and I'm here to argue confidence is more important than technically correct. Right. Most of the time, you know, if you're making the same mistake over and over and over and over and over and over and over, great. Let's talk technical. But if it's just a one-off mistake, confidence is going to help you a lot further than overanalyzing a baby mistake. So tell me one thing you want to improve the next day. One thing, one focus. You're in a sport that's like milliseconds. You can't tell yourself to do 17 things anyways. So pick one that you think, one correction that you think will be the most impactful. And then focus on three things that you did really well in that run. Because I promise you, you weren't as bad as you thought. Well, and like a couple things there. I think that just putting myself in that situation, sometimes it's harder to find three things because you're so used to being like, I did horrible. And you're like, okay, what'd you do good? And you're like, I did horrible, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and you can't, it's, it's a challenge. And so when you start to look at it that way, it just opens so many different perspectives circling back to all the things we just talked about. Um, but yeah, I, I think that that's really good. I mean, like you, you always have a choice in how you're showing up. And so, yeah, you can say I did horrible. I'm the worst. I did all of these 17 things wrong. No wonder I didn't place. I'm never going to do it. Tomorrow's going to be terrible. How am I ever going to recover? You totally can spiral down. And if you want to all the power to you, but that's on you when you show up the next day and everything feels hard and you don't rope well, those are choices that you made. So that's maybe a little bit of a hard truth or a hard pill to swallow, but that is the truth. So instead, recognize that you can choose to do better tomorrow. You can choose to focus on what went well today, even if it's hard. I don't care. You can choose to find <laughs> those things that you did well so you can roll in tomorrow feeling like, hey, okay, I know, my, I know what I'm focused on today. And also like yesterday wasn't that bad. Mm -hmm. I was confident outside the pen. I felt really secure when I backed up into the corner and it was when I nodded my head that I went crazy. Great. I'm going to repeat yeah. all the things I did well, and I'm going to make that one fix. Right. Choices. Well, and one thing I love about what you said is, you know, it sparked a thought in me. What if we put as much effort into degrading ourselves as we did to building ourselves up? Like, what would the it's outcome be then? It's almost like that's what I was saying about building confidence in all the quiet moments. It's almost like this is the thing that you can do at any given moment is you can mm -hmm. look for what you're doing well. You can look for what you're doing right. And then you can build from there rather than trashing yourself and find yourself in a really dark hole and having to build from there for no reason yeah. other than holes are, not cool. <laughs> holes yeah. are not cool. Holes are not cool. Don't like holes. Don't like holes. Okay. Our next question is, how do you keep the flame going when the fire is trying to burn out? And I will add on to that and say, you know, um, I think that when you continue to do something and maybe you're not seeing the results, sometimes it gets a little exhausting. Oh, yeah. No, I get it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think... If we're strictly talking about, well, two answers. <laughs> two answers. There's, there's always so much to say. I so know. One, I think that this is why understanding your bigger vision is really important, right? So like taking a moment of time and actually defining what success would look like for you in your sport before you get in that hole, right? So maybe if you're listening to this right now, everyone stop, define, what does, what would success look like for you in your sport if it, you had the best case scenario? And then why is that important to you? Why are you committed to making that a reality? And getting to know that intimately, because that's like the long-term goal. That's the vision five years from now. And it should mean something to you. So when I do this with clients, like I like to ask like, well, why is that important to you? They give an answer. And then say, well, why is that important to you? And they give an answer. And then, well, why is that important to you? So we can get deeper and deeper into like how these, these visions are connected to your soul and to you as a human, mm -hmm. not just as an athlete. Mm -hmm. 
And so in those moments of weakness and struggle, we can come back to that vision and say like, oh, this is why I'm going to keep showing up. This is why I'm going to keep believing in myself because this is important to me, right? Because you're going to have hard moments, right? If you're going to be in a sport for several years, there will be some lows, speaking from experience, there'll be some low lows and that they don't have to define you, but they are a part of it. And it's in those moments where I think reconnecting with that vision is really, really, really helpful. And the second part is when the motivation is low, it's where you really lean on discipline. So you don't feel good about what you're doing. So you don't feel like you want to jump out of bed and go train. Great. No one asked how you felt right now. We said, are you committed to the vision? And if so, how disciplined can you be in showing up for it? Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means doing the hard work when you don't feel like it. Sometimes that means asking for help when you don't feel like it. And sometimes that means being kind to yourself and taking a little rest. Like it's, it's really discipline as this, this opportunity to assess what do I need and doing it regardless of how you feel. Right. And a so, lot of the times it's hard when you don't, you know, there are going to be a lot of feelings and emotions, but taking those out and being mm -hmm. disciplined, we can do that. Oh yeah. Okay. I have one more question for you. I ask everybody on my podcast, if you could go back and tell your younger self something, what would it be and why? Gosh, I just throw that at me out of the blue. <laughs> well, that's the fun <laughs> part of it. Um, I think I did a pretty good job of this when I competed, like maybe the last few years of my career. Um, but I, I think everyone can hear it and I'd probably could, could have heard it more often in my own life is it's okay to show up as authentically yourself. You don't have to be somebody else in the pursuit of your big goals. You get to be all of you unapologetically and that when you show up as yourself and embrace all of your quirks and weirdnesses I've got a lot you end up enjoying the process more and when you enjoy the process more you do better and so I guess really what I would encourage myself as the the younger baby page is that it's okay to get to know yourself and to be yourself and to show up as her she's awesome yeah, I think that's great. And and I think that that's something that if more of us can embody and, and entail, like we are all created different for a reason, you know, and, yeah. and shine and, and be that and rise up. And it is scary to show up and be authentic, but why not? And who yeah. knows all the good things that can come from it. Absolutely. And I think too, when you're confident in being your authentic self, you can encourage other people to be authentically themselves and Man, wouldn't that be awesome to just have a whole gaggle of breakaway ropers who are confident in themselves and lift each other up because they're competitive in a great way, in a helpful way, yeah. in a confident way? Yeah, let's recreate it, man. Yeah, man. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been great today. So what about you? How do we get in touch with you? Where do we find you at? Where, where are Paige and all the things? Yeah. So you can follow me on Instagram at Paige Lawrence coaching, um, pop on over, slide into my DMS, say hello. If you want to, um, I love meeting people and I love being a resource. And then I also just started a podcast. It's called finding greatness. It's me and another Olympic athlete. And we talk about what that process looks of finding greatness in your own life. And we try to share stories and tangible lessons for little things that you can make improvements on in your own life to help you get a little bit closer to whatever greatness looks like in your own life. Well, and I will say that I have listened to it. I love it. And they're great little nuggets to apply to each and every <laughs> area of your life. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for coming and uh, we'll catch you down the road. Hey guys, thank you for listening to this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did, share it with a friend. If you haven't already, go follow us on all of our social media profiles at In The Loop Breakaway. And if you have any questions, go check out our website. Reach out to us at InTheLoopBreakaway.com. I really appreciate your continued support and we'll see you down the road.